And so we're going to be hearing from Sarah. Sarah, you're here. And uh, Alana Katapan, uh, Ryan Katney, Elena Niederman, and then uh, eventually Barb Blomhoff. And uh, the description online said uh, that you folks will be discussing your ongoing projects. Uh, the benefits of OER funding in supporting your work and practical considerations in creating, adapting and sharing OERs. You're certainly welcome to do that. Um, I, I could throw out a few more questions too that uh, you're welcome to answer or not respond to. So like what got you interested in OERs uh, to begin with? Um, what challenges? I guess maybe that's connected to the practical considerations. Um, would you do it again? Or are you planning on doing it again um, with a different project or similar project? And um, maybe what would you do differently if you are going to do it again? That sound OK. And I was thinking um, uh, we, we can have a fairly informal structure here. Um, do you want to just go around the panel and um, one by one and circle around and back and forth and uh, the, the panelists do you do you want to wait for questions till the end or do you want to take questions during the session does it matter however you want to do it you're in charge okay okay <laughs> all right mandatory questions then during it um okay so why don't we start and um sarah do you want to start mm. I, d I didn't really have anything prepared, Mark. Did oh, you OK. No, no, no. Uh, sorry, I, I thought that you might have been a uh, a co-recipient of one of these, but you're here just as an organizer like me. Oh, yeah. Right? Yeah. OK. Yeah. OK. So Alana, uh, do you want to start? Yeah, right? sure. I actually have some slides if they'll work really easily. If they won't, then I won't. I'm, I'm pressing share. We'll see what happens. Mm -hmm. um, and Ryan, would you mind popping into uh, the chat? Um, the website for Welcome to Canadian Politics, do you have it available? I think he's working on it. Um, welcome to Canadian Politics.ca is what it is. So I, yeah, my slides aren't going to work. That's okay. I didn't make them for you guys. I talk about this project quite a bit. Um, so Welcome to Canadian Politics is the name of our OER. It's an ongoing project that's based on an assignment that came out of my Canadian Intro to Canadian Politics class. And the project is really inspired and what got me into OER, like roundabout way to getting your question, is that there are very few um, Canadian politics textbooks that start from a place of contesting power relations. Um, it's really a discipline that historically has been taught about this is what the constitution is, this is how we get there, um, this is what parliament is, this is how we participate in parliament, et cetera. And so I wanted to think about how to build a online open access resource for students by students um, that could start from questioning sort of what constitutes Canadian politics in the first place. Um, and also I wanted students to have a, an assignment based something that would allow them to publish or somehow make their work available beyond the classroom. I feel like really um, selfish when I'm the only one who reads their work. Uh, so we generated an OER or an ongoing OER project is a better way to say that where students collaborate in over the course of the term on an assignment to create a online primer. You'll see it if you're looking up welcome to Canadian politics.ca um, where they're sort of building a social justice oriented textbook that at once uses sort of conventional norms and ideas around Canadian political science, but also adds other things to the equation. And the way that they do this is they select a group, choose a topic, conduct research, edit it in collaboration with RTAs, and hand it in as you would a normal group assignment. Um, but then uh, we take it on and edit it, uh, upload it to the website. Students have a chance to think about what they'd like to happen differently, and then we revise it again and make it go live. And the the impetus for this for me um, has really been about generating that that sort of open access tech and also having a place for students to go. But over time, and the OER project in particular, has been about making that more accessible and available and community oriented beyond my classroom. So I, I do it, a colleague at the University of New Brunswick does it, and the OER money has 
gotten us some some stuff to make it the website more accessible, more navigable. Um, but I'm going to just hand it over to Ryan for a second, uh, who's going to talk about what we're doing this year with the community of political scientists. So he's really leading the charge on that. I have very little to do with it. Yeah, so uh, Alana brought me onto this project uh, in the previous fall. So I'm working as a research assistant now. And really, uh, I'm taking part in, we figured we have all these students who are submitting these articles. So why not get some experts in each of these fields to write kind of an introductory piece to each section? Um, so, you know, if we have a section on the constitutional order in Canada, uh, finding an expert in that field to write, what does that mean? Um, what is, uh, you know, when we're talking about that field, traditionally, how has that been taught in political science? Um, how are things changing now? Uh, kind of where is the state of, of the field in terms of teaching now? And also what's still missing? So what are what's kind of the trajectory of um, how that field should be taught you know, in the next few years, five years, uh, something like that? Uh, we currently have over 15 of these introductory pieces uh, on the go on all sorts of uh, subfields and subtopics within Canadian political science. Um, the initial batch now is already coming out in April, so we've started this process. We're a few months into it now. So in the next month or so, um, a few of them are going to start making their way onto the website as we start getting them back from these experts. Um, we're even looking at uh, some of these experts are taking part in a roundtable um, that Alana and I are running at the upcoming Canadian Political Science Association, where we're going to be talking about um, this project. And also, as Alana was saying, just the broader project of kind of decentering traditional uh, topics and methods in teaching Canadian political science and kind of what that looks like in practical considerations for teaching this more kind of student driven social justice uh, driven um, way of teaching Canadian political science. Yeah, it's really just such a beast day eh? like we took this idea of this assignment in the first place and now the community of Canadian political science scholars is like helping us think through and driving how do we rethink if, if a discipline is a train or like a ship that we steer in different directions it's hard to shift um i feel like we're in a large conversation not only with our students now but with the broader discipline of canadian political scientists about like what do we call canadian political science and how do we shift that over time and i just want to answer catherine's question in the chat about whether our students chose choose or not choose to include. We've never had a group say they don't want their stuff included in the OER. Never, ever, ever. But we do give them a chance to say, do you want certain parts removed? Um, do you want your name not to appear on it, but you're still comfortable with the group's material being in it? And sometimes students who, for a wide variety of like personal and professional reasons, may or may not want their name on it. We have a lot of political science students who are affiliated with political parties who may not want the things that they've written with their group posted. Um, so in those cases, we will put their name perhaps on the front page and not in the individual articles, or they just choose not to have their name on it at all. And we're happy with that. We let them engage however they want. They fill out a form to let us know that and to give us feedback on the site and the project more broadly. Is that, I think we covered a lot of things there, Ryan. Yeah? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, I've, I've got a few questions, if I can throw them at you at this point yeah. and others please feel free to speak up or to add them to the chat um so just to clarify this for me so all of your students contributed to this oer in, working in small groups in that class yeah in that like class. not all of my students ever but my students no, in no. Um, canadian, canadian politics each year yeah. i teach the intro to canadian politics class yeah and they pick what topics they want we provide them with a list sometimes like of things that we're thinking about myself and heather miller at university of new brunswick who whose classroom does this as well. And sometimes they'll pick the same topic and we merge them into a new article, or sometimes they'll provide material or propose something that will add to a different article. Sometimes we get feedback from other profs about errors on the site because you know it's student driven and we try to fact check, but it doesn't always work out. So um, it's really sort of like a community wiki in a way about that like we really clearly moderate and are <laughs> careful about. Um, that ends up being this OER. And so what has happened or what will happen as you, as you go forward as uh, new classes of students come in, um, will they be contributing to the same existing OER or starting with the new one or? Yeah, so we've been at this for, hmm, I don't know what year it is, four years, four years now that we've been doing this project. 
I think over time, well, Canadian politics evolves. It evolves all the time. So there may be new articles. We might have them edit existing ones, um, but it might become, it's a question that we have as well. Like how, when do we cut this off in terms of a completed document? But I don't think we need to. I think that there's always things that can be revised and edited and challenged. Um, Canadian political science textbooks pretty much issue a new edition every election. Um, and so I imagine that there'll be new issues and ideas that we want to revise and uh, include over time. But it is an important question, like what does it mean to, to create boundaries around this? Because it can't be everything. Um, Catherine, I do not have any concerns about running out of topics. I have concern about there being too many topics in the site becoming unwieldy. We don't want it to be an encyclopedia. Welcome. Why don't you want it to become an encyclopedia? Well, that exists, right? There are encyclopedias of, of like the Canadian Encyclopedia. It covers a lot of the similar topics to us. We do want it to remain focused on what we think of as politics and political science so that it remains a usable and navigable resource for students of Canadian political science. But it like continues to exist within the domain of Canadian political science textbooks, but also contests what, what they normally comprise. That was the vision anyway. Perhaps as this grows, people will shift that vision. Do you want it to remain a certain size, though? Like, I don't know what the typical size of a political science textbook would be. Let's say 300 pages. What if this mm -hmm. could this grow to be 800 or the equivalent oh, of yeah, 800 sure. pages? Yeah, sure. And people could take it in different directions as they navigate through it. You know, it's uh, free and online. Yeah. And um, but we do want to make sure that we can. It's it's um, manageable enough for those of us yeah. who are on the back end of things that we can find things if we're looking for them and, and for other people to do as well. And searchability is one thing that we're working on too. It's not particularly searchable at the moment. So for the OER, we're, we're making it more accessible in a variety of ways. And one of them is to make it more accessible to screen readers. Our current layout isn't. The menu isn't that useful, I think, at the moment, and we're revising that. We'd like it to auto-generate PDFs so people who need printed versions of things can use them, but also searchability is a concern. And there's a bunch of other accessibility requirements that for the best practices for um, websites and OERs that we're not currently engaging in that we're working on. And how do you assess it? Well, there is a very excellent web designer that we work with who um, has protocols for this. This exists for websites. What makes a navigable website? What makes an accessible, um, what makes an accessible sort of uh, artifact or mechanism publication? And so she is working with us. I, I don't know anything about it really. Like I, I know what I know as an instructor, but there are experts who um, are walking us through it. And the, and the students, so how do you assess them since they're working oh. collaboratively? Yeah, they, uh, you know, there's a rubric. They also do a self and peer assessment form where they assess themselves and the other people in their group um, and they provide feedback at other points in the process. But we, we treat it kind of like a short essay in a conventional sense. They do work on it in tutorials. So their TAs have a, a sense of what's going on as well. They bring drafts, they bring a proposal, they work through it as a group, but they get a group grade for it. Mm -hmm. It's one of many assignments in the course. Okay. Uh, Sarah is asking, uh, do you have a sense of how many classes outside of UW and UNB are using this source? Yeah, so you, the UW and UNB groups are the ones who are generating it. We do know, and I haven't been tracking this, this is a question that I've been getting a lot lately though, so maybe I need to do better metrics or like actually pay attention. We, we haven't been trying to sell it or, or I don't want to say sell it, but to um, make it used by other people because we're sort of in the still initial stages. It's still kind of bare bones, I think, in terms of some of the topics. So we haven't really been pushing it for people to use, but I do know that there's high schools using it um, just from the WordPress statistics that I get that that's, it's used in several Canadian high school classrooms and certainly it's being accessed by people at universities. I just don't know to what extent that occurs. I don't know how good Word, WordPress's stats are, but that's all we're using for stats at this point. Mm -hmm. Maybe at some point I'll get more serious about it. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm just glancing through some of the pages here and um, earlier this morning we had a, a session on uh, copyright. So the, the images that you have here, um, is that a big challenge finding images to use in the in the OER? Not so far. 
We use a lot of um, Wikimedia. We use a lot of images also that are um, free with credit from the Canadian Library and Archives. And there's some other sort of sources for Canadian historical images that allow us to use them open access. And the conversations I've had with other archives, the, the BC archives um, in particular, have been quite generous about the potential use as long as it's for educational purposes, free online and credited. Other questions? We, from... we do pay attention to that. <laughs> Other questions from anybody else here? Ryan, am I missing anything? I feel like I'm just like you're so on the back end of all the introductions, and I'm and I'm the front end of selling this thing. But no, I I mean I I think I think you're covering covering everything. If I think of something, I'll I'll, I'll butt in. All right. Well, I see uh, Elena is typing um, while she's doing that, or if she's doing that. Um, I do have two last questions for me, at least. Um, one, one is, um, uh, what have the students said? Like, what is the benefit to the students? Like for their assignment? Well, they get a grade for it, so that's fun. Yeah, yeah. Um, no, how, how's it enhanced so, but, their learning? Yeah, for sure. So this this assignment draws on an assignment I developed very early on in my career, which was students writing, rewriting an article on feminism in Canada. The Wikipedia article on feminism in Canada was not great. I was teaching feminism in Canada. I knew they would access it, so they rewrote it. It's much better now. I'm really happy with it. And so they had the experience of sort of getting really quickly up to speed on the general way the issue was presented, and then also developing a public-facing resource, drawing on their research to um, Meliorate the situation. Um, one of the principles of my teaching it draws on critical pedagogy is building community beyond the classroom um, and also challenging the student instructor hierarchy. I don't need to tell them what constitutes Canadian politics. They live in Canada, they know what politics is, they're in second year. But to figure out what they think Canadian politics should be and to get up to speed really fast on what the what a conventional textbook does and what else they could do. Um, addresses many of my sort of pedagogical goals in terms of content for the course, it occurs fast. But also collaborating to create information that will be accessible to the world and having a citation in their name. All of these things are sort of the potential benefits to students. I also think working together on a project like this early on in the term has been a major contributor to community in my classroom. Their capacity to engage in dialogue with one another, to build sort of friendships and experiences together. Elena is wondering how many students you have in a class. Oh, it varies. We sometimes teach two sections. So this year, I think I have 37 or 38. Um, and other years, I've had 65 or 70. I don't think this would be possible in a 200 person class unless you had some really active TAs. You can do it. You can do it. <laughs> I, 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 I have one last question. Um, is this the is this the kind of um, project? I mean, there's a lot of um, impetus at our university now towards indigenization. So is this something that would lend itself well to that? It's a huge part of why we started the project. The Canadian political science textbooks are doing an increasingly good job of addressing um, Indigenous politics, Indigenous histories, and the role of indigeneity in shaping what constitutes Canada and Canadian politics in the first place. But they're not great. And I think that uh, one of the, like, I wanted a textbook myself that started with the idea of colonialism, colonialism in the settler state. And right now we have an introduction being written to this project that does that, that centers Canadian politics around colonialism in the settler state. That just doesn't occur to the same extent that we were hoping in conventional textbooks. So in addition to that, we have yeah, several articles on Indigenous politics and indigeneity, issues related to indigeneity woven throughout some of the other issues. So yeah, it's been a major impetus for this project. And like the students uh, step up every year. Okay. We have an article this year right on the creation of Nunavut, I think, that just is being edited right now. Uh, Ryan, did you have any other thoughts that have occurred to you? Um, there, there was something to, uh, as part of this, these introductions that we've been gathering, uh, some people just because of, of time, you know, have done interviews, um, and guided conversations with us and, and something, um, that came up in, in one of those recently, uh, you know, has come to mind that one of the, these leading scholars we were talking to was talking about just 
how much in a lot of these subfields of Canadian politics too, um, the focus of professors is student driven. So in her case, she teaches a lot of law oriented classes and she was speaking about how uh, things related to police relationships um, with marginalized communities, uh, you know, wasn't really on the teaching agenda uh, the same way it was prior to the George Floyd protests. Um, so as we're speaking to about topics and um, what's going to come on the website, uh, I mean, like Alana was saying, it's not for her or anyone else to say what is Canadian politics issues right now that we're not even considering. I'm sure five, ten years from now will be showing up on the website and um, just as part of this ever evolving process. So I think really the student driven nature of this, too, is is something that's exciting going forward. And as we Ryan, you're making me think of like as we've been talking to the community of Canadian political science scholars, and I'm thinking of one email exchange in particular, you know, with who. Um, it was a really generative exchange where an Indigenous, a senior Indigenous scholar was like, you are still organizing this along conventional lines. You're not breaking out in the way that you say you want to. And here are some suggestions and ideas for how to challenge what you're already doing. So even in the conversations that Ryan in particular has been having about the introductions and the conversations between myself and Heather Miller and Ryan and the scholars in the field, even our own ideas of what we thought the website would be are being challenged by people who are committed to progressive agendas, committed to indigeneity, committed to anti-racist scholarship in a way we haven't seen before in the field, I think. I don't know. That might be giving us too much credit. But certainly the scholars in the field are reshaping even what we think this project is doing. Okay. So it's not just pulling in indigenized articles. It's um, mm -hmm. rethinking the epistemology, bringing... Yeah, like how, do we, is how do we even start the conversations, you know? And so, yeah, we, we the menu reformatting, the like reshifting of all those articles, but also some of the new topics that we weren't even thinking about when we solicited these, like, I'm, Ryan, I can't even remember our original list, but our original list of the introductions we wanted to solicit has been turned upside down all around by people saying, no, that's that's the same as what we're always doing. This is how I think we could be doing it differently. Can we find somebody to do that? Okay. Um, well, thanks, Alana and Ryan. Um, Elena, can we move on to to you? I think Bar yeah, Barb has joined us now. So, um, but you you go ahead, Elena. Thank you so much. So I uh, I don't know if I can maybe share my screen to just show you what the project looks like. So I'll try and do that. Mm -hmm. But I uh, just wanted to tell you a little bit about the inspiration that um, drove that project. So I have been doing um, a course that's called Sociology of Health. And uh, part of this course, what we had students do, and that, that's a big course. So we had anywhere between 150 to 200 students in this course. And one of the assignments that students had in this course would be to go out and interview an older adult about the experiences of aging so that they can actually kind of then think about these experiences, use some of the material we cover in class to analyze these experiences, reflect on them, and then consider what the aging process is all about. And so then this was the project that we used in that class for some time. And then at some point, Catherine Tong, my uh, core um, investigator, myself, we kind of looked at it and said, it's sometimes there is quite a lot of challenge for individuals to find an older adult, right? And it turns out that not a lot of young people or students have older adults in their life that they can reach out to. And especially if you're an international student and you're looking for some, so how do you create that? But there is enormous value in speaking to older adults and enormous value in trying to understand how it looks like. So what Catherine and I decided to do, we um, decided to create a live stories of older adults and make those digital live stories. So um, thanks to the wonderful people like Daniel from CEO and um, the team, they helped us create that uh, book, what we call the um, Life Stories of Older Adults, Insights on Life and Aging. So what we've done where with this something on a similar to what you were describing, we uh, kind of had a vision, but we didn't really have a clear understanding of how that vision will come into fruition. All we knew is that we wanted to be really student centered. We wanted the stories to be generated by students with students and become helpful to students as well. And that was kind of the driven idea behind this. 
and we wanted them to be stories of older adults, but how, what, where, that was already open for interpretation. So we had a few students that we just reached out to and we said, folks, we're looking to create this resource. Would you be willing to interview an older adult and you can do it in any way you want so we subject give some suggestions right we said if you want maybe it can be a video maybe it can be audio maybe it can be something else and and we didn't give them students more instruction than that and we sort of send them out into the uh big world so we had uh eight interviews conducted by students and because our students are very diverse we turned out to have very diverse um, life stories that were recorded by students and the context of it, the duration of it, the setting of it and all of it was quite, quite different. So we had um, just uh, created that. So I'm just going to show you a little bit of the uh, of the stories, just a little bit of, of the of the kind of snapshot of the participants. So we had somebody, for example, who was an older adult who worked as a physician for many years. So her interview was longer and then she shared a little bit of her experiences working, how medicine looked like back then, and sort of a lot of students of ours are aspiring physicians. So that was really revealing for them to learn about that. Also uh, sharing a little bit of the uh, of the information about that and then we had uh, somebody who was uh, and just a you know a person who was writing books and was an author a published author we had an older adult who was talking about the experiences of immigration and and kind of settlement into Canada and we had an interview that was done just the uh, audio interview where the participant didn't necessarily want to be recorded and so in that interview they were telling about how they came to Canada many years ago and where they are with their children and great children. Um, we also had some individuals who rather than uh, having the actual interview conducted I'm just wondering if I'm wondering, Mark, would, would that be okay if I share uh, just one of the of the teaser, teaser yeah. videos? And maybe we'll Absol choose something. Absolutely. Something yeah. that is um, smaller to, to show how it looks like. So we had then uh, all these different participants from different backgrounds. Some of them didn't speak English and they had to put the transcription and some of them did speak English and some of these were just video recordings, some audio recordings and some people just had some of the pictures shared with us, but not necessarily the actual recording of the video. So maybe if um, if you can hear it, I'll just uh, run this one um, one teaser and then I can talk a little bit more about it. Can you hear it okay? Do you have a sound? No, I think what you what you'll need to do, um, Elena, is uh, go back into the share button, and then when you click it, uh, over to the right top corner, it says include computer sound, and if you slide that over, it should do it. Then I need to stop sharing for a Yeah, second. just stop and then reshare. Uh, okay. Include computer sound. Yeah, I yeah, can see that. All right, so let me start it again. Yep. I definitely think they need education. Like, but like that you can't get, not in today's world anyway, very far without having uh, at least a university education. That's what it's been. That's the stage that it's not so you see. Back in my day, a grade 10 education, a high school level education, you could have got any kind of job you wanted. Like I could have gone into the insurance business. Like I know I could have gone into the accounting business just based on my mathematics ability. Um, you didn't have to like have any like specific thing, like a degree or anything of that nature back in those days. Uh, that's changed dramatically now. Like secretaries need degrees. Like it's kind of mind boggling when you think about it. I would say as far as I'm concerned, Try not to be idle. 
right? Keep yourself occupied in some fashion. Uh, and the, there's all kinds of things, you know, that you can do. So you, you, you've got to keep occupied. I think the worst thing you can do is let yourself go down that hill of sitting in a chair and doing nothing. Because it doesn't quite fit in with your previous norm or something. So, um, so this is one of the teasers. So in addition to creating those videos, and we have them, as I said, in VRS Lens, one of them was almost an hour and another one maybe five minutes to seven minutes, and then you go in. And we also decided to create a little bit of prompts for the instructors who are interested in taking that resource into their classroom so that they can think about what exactly can be done with, the, with, with those videos. And we provided some ideas for instructors, be that maybe thinking about uh, reflection prompts for students that can look at the stories and maybe think a little bit more about how the process of aging might or might be different from what the older adults are telling. We had a little bit of additional ideas about how these can be used and we suggested that that can either use separately, so each story can be taken as sort of a case study and explored more in depth in the class. Or you can maybe take stories from older adults who came from diverse backgrounds and examine how the immigration process was different or the life in Canada, where they are right now with their grandchildren and sort of reflect on those differences. So there are many different ways in which, in which this can be done. And one thing that I um, think I appreciated the most was that we did kind of have that vision where students would be driven the, the driving the project. And in the end of the day, we maybe a little bit, we did need to do a little bit of support to our students because when you go out and do whatever, it doesn't necessarily work very well. But uh, we did find that students were very resourceful in reaching out to individuals from their backgrounds and sort of searching for uh, stories and coming up with pretty neat stories. So we were very happy with 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 the outcome. There's a, a few questions, Elena. Um, one from Alana is, uh, what was the production slash editing process? The, the title slides are beautiful. There was clearly a lot of work on the production side of things. So do you want to respond to that first of all? Um, that was all Daniel, right? So this is what was really amazing for us because part of it, we were terrified. We were terrified was what who is going to be doing that because I understand in video production as much as the next person, right? Like I have absolutely no idea of what, what that would entail. But it turned out that all of this very heavy lifting, the heaviest that we could imagine, was taken off our plate. So the uh, CEO team was was helping us out with that, and they did absolutely beautiful job. They invited our input and, and provided some suggestions, but they really could uh, help us out quite a lot. So we didn't do any editing part, which was amazing for a person like me who has, you know, no understanding of the process. Yeah. Uh, and Elena has a second question. Do you have a sense of how people are using them? So I don't know if people are using it already. We just, we still finishing up. We kind of went through the final touches, final tuning. We just started the process in, 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 in the summer. And in the summer, we had students going out and doing those stories. And then we kind of had to put them through editing and collecting them. So right now, all we have is that this kind of prototype that we sort of finalizing and running and piloting, and sort of making sure that it works. But our vision would be, so I'm not teaching the sociology of aging class, Catherine does. And sort of one of the things that she wanted to do is to bring it to the class and ask students to use that as one of those stories. So imagine if you um, talking about something like immigration and older life, right? And rather than just going through the dry text and try to explain it to students, you're showing those stories and then these, it becomes a different story altogether, right? Or like we're talking about class differences. So, and again, we have people coming from very diverse backgrounds, so you could potentially contrast and compare the, 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 the life of one older adult versus the other in sort of where they are today. So this is how we envision it would be done so that by um, kind of maybe stimulating discussion in a classroom, using it as a case study, or even kind of doing the reflection stories for those people who may have it difficult to find all the adult to interview, but now you have a life story that you can analyze. Mm -hmm. uh, 
Uh, Catherine has a, a question. So will you keep adding to this collection of stories? And if so, will the demographics of the subjects be entirely student driven or will you try to determine who uh, hasn't been included and seek out those subjects? Yeah, I mean, we we weren't planning on it, so that was really like a short term project that we had envisioned and we collected and the, the it was driven by students because it was really who responded to us and then students went out and uh, collected the stories and I kind of always am saying that um, we uh, at least in the School of Public Health Sciences where that course is offered focusing on trying to promote diversity and uh, we do definitely need to promote a lot of diversity among our instructors but uh, our student body is already incredibly diverse and sort of driving on students experiences a lot of them turned out to the relative or friends or neighbors and you could see how diverse aging is in Canada because we continue to think about aging Canadians in a very white kind of you know middle class kind of way which is not necessarily true because today you see how 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 like you know there's a lot of different individuals the answer of things to our students you could see how this really is reflective of the change in Canadian landscape and demographic profile of Canadians. Mm -hmm. Uh, oh, and um, Rachel uh, posted a link to the CEL Agile Development Team, and I'm wondering if she is uh, proposing that as a, a way of getting um, some editing and production help. Um, yeah. I'm not, yeah, go ahead, Rachel. I was just putting it in there since uh, Elena mentioned it, um, and that's, um, I wasn't on this project, Daniel was, but and, and Jana um, helped with it as well, um, but we are always happy to get requests for assistance with various projects. So that's why I threw it in there. OK, thanks, Rachel. Yeah, I should give a shout out to Jenna because uh, she, she was wonderful. So the, like Daniel and Jen, they just kind of took, it's just the magic what they work. I, I don't have other words for that, truly. And Sarah's asking, uh, did you ever have issues with the recordings, uh, like lighting, sound problems, things like that? Yeah, yeah. So there was, a, so students went out and some individuals Kind of recorded the stories where they where they could record. And so sort of one of the videos that was recorded in some factory, and so you can hear during the video that there is some behind like a machine noise so that doesn't go away. And uh, I I know that the um, uh, Daniel Jen tried to get rid of it, but it it wasn't getting readable. I don't know if you can say it, but you know it it stayed there. And we figured it's okay because it shows the actual real life individuals and some. Uh, all the adults were very particular about being filmed in their room next to their fireplace and next to their book. The others one wanted to see a picture, like have a picture of kebab next to them to kind of demonstrate elements of their culture. So we decided to preserve those original images because those were significant and meaningful to all the adults who decided to, to contribute their time for this for this project. So you, you could see in the video that there's some imperfections uh, with those kind of recording that kind of settings. Um, well, the American poet Wallace Stevens said uh, the imperfect is our paradise, you know, that we need the imperfect. Um, I've, I've got one other question, maybe more will be coming in. Um, what was my question? Oh, yeah. So you mentioned at the beginning uh, the um, how did you put it? The enormous value that this has for students, you know, talking to the elderly. Uh, what about for the subjects subjects themselves? What kind of impact or benefit did this have to the uh, older people you were talking with? Oh, I, I think so. In, in the beginning, when we were planning to do it, um, we had doubts whether or not we're going to find people who will be willing to go in and become sort of available, like the images and stories on the internet. Not everybody would necessarily agree to do that. But I do think that there is a great value, great deal of value for older adults to share these stories because these stories are using for educational purposes. They're talking about their lives. They're giving advice to younger generation. And I do think there's some sort of a sense of accomplishment sharing that story and knowing that that's story has a value, which is actually one of the um, things that we were very clear about, because one of the caveats that we experienced at the beginning, we had to sign a media release form, 
uh, to get to make sure that we are like legally okay to use those videos. And our media release form, like the generic one, was like, oh, we're allowed to post these videos like everywhere, like, you know, on promotional materials. And some of the adults were very concerned about that. So we had to go back and get the permissions that reflected the fact that this is really for educational purposes. This is what it's intended for. We're not going to put you on the marketing brochure for the University of Waterloo. That's not the goal. The goal is to really use it for educational purposes. And that's how a lot of people kind of, um, you know, got signed up onto that project. OK, OK. Any any other questions for Elena? Um, uh, Alana is asking if they see the participants. Uh, the oh, yeah. So shared with older adults to ensure that everything is okay. So I think that some of them probably have seen it, others I'm not sure. But yeah, that was part of the idea as well, so that it becomes kind of vetted by them. Well, as as Armin said, um, don't be idle. You know, <laughs> I think that's good advice for for all of us. Um, so can we move on to to Barb now? I'll take it away, Barb. Yeah, I I'm doing a uh, sort of a I guess a textbook adjacent <laughs> OER, which is for some content that I am at a concern that it will be extinct content, and so I wanted to preserve it. It's content about Canada's trading situation. Uh, the way that we are different from the United States is that we're very very open, but we also don't have a lot of influence. And that's a difficult concept to um, to communicate to students. They come to our class kind of assuming that you know we are active in trade policy. We, we are we're not unactive, inactive in trade policy, but we um, really can't um, do much to better our um, like our our situation strategically. Whereas the, a, a country like the United States really could. So the OER is called Anything But a Tariff, and it's written in as, you know, as much as possible in kind of non-econ jargon. That's very hard to do, but I've tried to make it as, um, you know, um, accessible as possible in terms of its language. I will share with you just quickly what it looks like and what how it's, you can see uh, how it is. Um, there we go. So how it is like a uh, a textbook. So this is on eCampus Ontario's a website, and it uh, just kind of um, has a little content tab. I'm going to show you one of the pages in the uh, main body. We're still sort of working. I'm still working out the um, the ways to um, present sorry, the ways to organize the information, but um, it's basically a series of economic diagrams that are um, interactive in a sense. So uh, I, I have a, a little slider down here and it's gonna move to the next slide. And it shows a new uh, part of the argument about you know the um, information that's being motivated here. So, and then we move on to another part of uh, this very simple two good model. And there's a little bit of equation um, discussion here. And at every point in the slider, there's a, a new caption that goes through the um, content. And uh, just and then there'll be a punchline um, kind of, um, piece of information to sort of lead you to the next chapter. So, and again, it's um, still in development form here. I, I still have uh, another module to add to it, but um, let's see if I can just show the thing that is the hardest to explain to students is um, the difference in value that the world, the steeper line has for our goods and services and what we would uh, value our goods and services at if we were just 
autarkic and weren't trading. So um, what we want to move to is a situation like this where we're off of our um, production possibilities curve and we're doing well because we're playing to our strengths. So that's a little bit of the feel of the um, ebook. I'm just going to come back and join you now. So a little bit of the motivation for why to put this into um, an ebook. It is um, one of the oldest areas of economic uh, thought to consider how countries interact with one another. It's one of the very first things that became a subdiscipline. The thing that happens is we have very expensive textbooks. They're published for an American market. And even though um, Canada, you know, pre the pandemic, six out of every 10 cents of GDP had some international content to it, uh, very different than the American uh, market, there's not much information in um, textbooks about what makes Canada special, the fact of um, being too small to affect world prices. So that's a subtle point. It's a complex point. It's important because other countries and other textbooks, which are written for larger countries, larger markets, would talk about strategic tariff policy in detail. And, you know, you'd be expected to test on it, right? It's not really um, a concept for, uh, for a country like Canada. It would shoot us in the foot to do that. So I was taught this information by... Um, by my uh, second year international economics professor. And he, uh, I wanted to reach out to him to find out a little bit more about this content because I thought it should be, um, you know, put into posterity if it's not going to be in the, you know, the basic two or three textbooks. Don't really spend a lot of time talking about the case of a small open economy. So I reached out to Bram Cadsby to ask him uh, about, um, you know, this, this, you know, to, to talk to him about an OER and to talk about that thing. And it turns out that he's passed away. And so this content has even more significance to me now because it was taught to me by him. Very, I remember very vividly how um, emphatically he uh, laid out the argument for why you would, you know, even for a non-economic goals, you would never use a tariff in Canada, you would use something else. And, um, so now I uh, I'm in the process of writing up the text to dedicate this uh, OER to this co um, you know colleague now, but at that time he was a mentor, like a an instructor of mine, and uh, just so that it's preserved forever and that um, you know everybody can see what he taught me so eloquently. I should say that this so this content doesn't appear in the textbook that I use when I teach second year international trade. It's uh, a textbook that's written by excellent people, a fantastic textbook, but it's, uh, you know, it's written for a market that's 10 times the size of Canada's, right? Uh, it's, a, it's written for an American market. And as I said, they're a large enough country that strategic tariff policy is a thing, right? It, it would be a thing that you do. So I teach this content in about 12 minutes in one class. Um, and I have always wondered whether students got it. You know, it's it's complex. It's what I call live drawing. You draw it as you go. And the stages of the diagrams are really important. There are things that you can draw wrong. So I always test this material so that I've got a benchmark of whether or not students get it. But um, I, I also have an assignment that I give students that walks them through the implications of anything but a tariff. And so with that uh, commensurate assignment, that activity, many students get it, but I think with an OER, I think more students will get it. And I have also, uh, I, I was, I was I had the benefit of having a research assistant to help me to, to do um, some of the um, research for the OER, but also, uh, this um, research assistant was able to pull together versions of my assignment, the assignment that I I give in class, and so I so the OER comes with these uh, 
artifacts that prof you know instructors can use to just just get a benchmark of whether people are getting the point of of the economic theory that's being uh, put in there. So um, I'm really excited about the 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 um, object. I think it's going to be very interesting to Canadian trade economists, and uh, I have been. Um, uh, I haven't been I, I, informally advised, um, so I better explain that. I've been informally advised that uh, I will be uh, presenting the OER at the Canadian Economics Association meetings in Winnipeg this year, informally because we're doing a fest shift for um, three professors in my research group that we've lost this year, one Bram Cadsby and then uh, Stuart Mestelman and Andy Muller. Um, so, I know that this will be part of that fest shift, and um, I'm excited to present it to friends and colleagues there. So uh, yeah, I, I think that gives you a bit of an overview. I hope uh, you'll um, have questions for me about the object. Sorry, I was <laughs> muted. Uh, can I ask a question uh, for clarification? So before the existence of this, you did teach this content, but only in a 12, uh, 12 minute chunk of a course. So this yeah. allows you to go into more detail. Well, it allows students to repeat it. Um, OK, it takes about 12 minutes to lay it out. And uh -huh. international trade theory is a what we what, what, what's the euphemism? It's a dense content. It's very content rich and so um, I think this is important so I dedicated uh, a, a class to it a discussion you know a 12 minute mini lecture and then an assignment and some writing right so I think it's important I think I don't think you should graduate from an undergraduate program and with a trade credit and not know about the small open economy case but um, yes it takes 12 minutes to go through it in a lecture. Um, the thing is when I do go through it in the lecture, students don't ask questions. Right. And so I get the sense that they're kind of trying to figure out how the lines intersect, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So being able to back, you know, go back and layer it. This is a, these are, um, you know, six diagrams that overlap, right? And they move this, the, the, argument from the base diagram and then they layer on here's the movement to the next point of theory and then consider the third case which is that's going to hurt you so here's how it hurts you here's how you see that it hurts you and something else is available as a country um, so students can they can stumble over that they can go back they can read it again and uh, it's built up sort of systematically and and carefully so that it, it's um, thorough but uh, staged not hopefully not overwhelming I mean mm -hmm. I'm gonna get some feedback on that hopefully and Catherine has a question you might have touched upon this a bit um, but can you comment on the open in economics and uh, as you mentioned uh, you're presenting this at a conference in Winnipeg uh, what do you think the reaction will be the uptake um economists are you know we're about mutual gains from trade right so open is a you know, a welcome concept, construct. Um, we, uh, I'm not aware of a lot of people who are teaching international economics who are not relying on a, what's the opposite of open, a closed, a textbook, because it's so content, ri content rich and it's um, it's difficult for a student to navigate the, the economic theory behind international trade without having that um, structure. However, as I said, it's deficient in this way, and I think uh, I think introducing the OER will be very well received. I hope it's well received. I mean, okay, um, Alana, I, I don't think she has a question, but she's I think she's commenting that there might be some cross pollinization between uh, her project and yours. Yeah. Um, Rachel is wondering, do you know? Uh, did you know going into the OER what you wanted it to look like or be and how does what you were able to create compare to that vision? So the only thing I knew was that it was extremely complex mm -hmm. and uh, I have to echo what has been said before about the agile development team. I I can't believe what they've done with my 
Bush League little diagrams, right, that I've kind of mapped together. I've tried really hard to make it simple for them to understand what it is, how they're layered. And uh, I've tried to be mindful of how I give them the modules, the content, the, the diagrams, but I can't for the life of me understand how they've managed to put it together. It looks beautiful. Mm -hmm. It looks so much better than it would in a textbook. I had no idea, sure. Rachel, what was possible. And uh, when and these guys are so humble too, right? They're like, "Oh, well, Daniel, I think you could probably do this in press, but I don't know. There's this little thing." And Jan is like, "I think Agamotto, you know." And they're just so humble about it. <laughs> and they've really created magic with with mm -hmm. the um, this complex, complex content, right? I mean, mm -hmm. we are the last bastion of. I, I don't I don't know if that's totally true, but I feel like we're the last bastion of these really complex diagrams that that. Mm -hmm kind of spell out um, what we could do in math too, right? There's, <laughs> there's commensurate math to go with it, but a second year student needs a picture, but even these pictures are tough to draw. Yeah. And so, yeah, I, I just cannot say enough about CEL and, and the Agile team particularly. They're just so professional and just way exceeded my expectations for what this could look like. Mm -hmm. um uh, Elena will probably get the uh, the last question here, and then Catherine is pointing out as well that each of you will be profiled in the Daily Bulletin this week, I guess starting tomorrow. Uh, Elena's question is, do you see uh, this OER being integrated into your teaching as a self-study piece or along with lecture other content related to this topic? It's an interesting question, Elena. I really feel like um, if the pandemic has taught me anything, it's belt and suspenders. I feel like this is such an important topic. I need to do it in class. It's 12 minutes, right? But I also know that people have lives and universal design is really important to me. And this open um, educational resource allows that flexibility and fluidity. And I can say at the beginning of a lecture, look, I'm gonna do something the way it was taught to me by this amazing person and why it resonates with me and why it, it it mattered to me so much that I did my training in, in international economics and my PhD. And, you know, it, it's, it was so interesting to me and the diagrams are so elegant and I'm gonna show them to you now. And then they can have the, the OER as well. So belt and suspenders, I, I, don't, I don't think anybody is diminished by having both. And I'm so grateful to be able to, you know, provide archive for this. Mm -hmm. Okay, it's, that's great. it's almost extinct content. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, I want to thank all of the uh, panelists who've presented today. Thank you so much, and uh, all the people who've attended.